Welcome to Finite Element Modeling. Today we'll be discussing an abacus tutorial on how to model fracture using the cohesive elements. And for today's lecture, having got invited Vishesh, who is going to guide us through that tutorial. But before we step into that tutorial, I want to first discuss the main objectives of this particular tutorial. I'm going to give a very basic introduction to fracture mechanics. You can find extensive amount of information on fracture mechanics in other video lectures. Uh, we'll also discuss a basic, a very basic introduction to the cohesion of elements. And then we'll provide the example simulation that Vishesh is gonna guide us through of the mode one double cantilever beam test, which is intended to measure the fracture toughness of a material. Some of the topics discussed today can be learned more about studying the analytical modeling of the mechanics of nucleation and growth of cracks uh, on a thesis I worked on. You can find that in the Virginia Tech website. So why do structures have collapsed? Uh, they have collapsed due to many different reasons from manufacturing defects, from uh, manufacturing problems, from environmental effects, and also from hidden flaws that were growing over time without going undetected. And on the left side, you will see a list of structural systems that have failed from bridges to buildings to aircraft applications they have failed, and ships as well, they have failed due to flaws propagating. So flaw propagation is a very important consideration in design of systems in aerospace design, civil engineering, and mechanical designs. So what is, what is fracture exactly? So fracture is really the creation of new surfaces within the body and steps in this fracture process include the crack formation, the initiation of that flaw, and then the propagation of that flaw. And the fracture can be either ductile or brittle. Uh, and ductile fracture usually occurs in most, com most metals. Um, you'll have a lot of extensive plastic deformation ahead of the crack tip. In brittle fracture, uh, you will see, for example, where Delamination composite materials could be brittle fracture, depends on the composite. Some of them can be more tough than others. Um, and the crack usually is unstable and propagates rapidly without increasing the applied stress. But at the end of the day, I think the important message here is to understand what fracture really means. And if you were to have a piece of paper and you were to break that piece of paper, you will see that new surfaces formed when the crack grew in that piece of paper. The creation of those new surfaces takes energy and that energy required is what drove, drove the crack to propagate. And so what were the steps? The crack had to initiate in that paper and then it propagated through that paper. There are many different techniques for predicting fracture. Uh, and I covered that in other video lectures, but today's focus is the cohesive elements, the cohesion elements, using interface elements. So let me go into that a little bit more. Again, very basic introduction, not very go going very deep. So cohesive, cohesive or decohesion elements can be used to predict failure by inserting special elements. And those special elements are called interface elements. And I'll discuss that a little bit later. But for now, uh, think that you have two blocks of material. They're perfectly bonded. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to assume that in between these two blocks, there's a spring. That spring is infinitely stiff. In such a manner, if I were to try to pull them apart, these blocks will not be pulled apart very easily because it's very stiff. And so if I were to plot the force response in that spring, as a function of deflection across these two blocks, you'll see a plot like this, the force T versus deflection. So initially you can see that it's very, very stiff. And that's high stiffness that's put in there, put in there to simulate the fact that these two pieces are very hard to pull apart. And if I were to pull them apart, most of the deformation will happen within the blocks. 
And so this stiffness is usually selected to be extremely high, uh, 10 times or 20 times or 100 times an order of magnitude or two greater than the stiffness of these two blocks. By doing so, what I'm doing now is simulating almost like a perfect bond because the higher the stiffness this is, the less likely this will separate. So that's done on purpose. That's done to keep these two blocks together. And that's a very little trick. So that initial stiff behavior should represent no fracture. So when that stiffness is two times an order of magnitude or two of that block, and I apply a load, those two blocks will not come apart very easily. And so I'm simulating no fracture with this fake stiffness that's quite high. But when I reach a particular strength, where that's the strength of the material, say, then fracture can start occurring. And at that point in time, it's gonna follow this curve where may follow this curve. There's many ways to simulate it. Some people use a bilinear behavior, some others use uh, some trapezoidal behavior, depends on the material system. But here I've used an exponential law because that's what my work, my research work was on. So here as the, the, the traction achieves a particular value, at that point in time, then you start to see that's easier, the delta starts getting easier to separate with decreased load, which means that now things can come apart easier. This spring now is going to fracture or is going to simulate fracture now because it becomes softer. You can see here that the stiffness is lower and lower and lower and lower until the traction drops to zero and the separation is quite big. So you can see this exponential relationship is allowing spring to fail and is allowing the spring to become softer over time, allowing it to simulate the fracture process. This right here can be represented with this equation here. As delta, for example, when delta is one, you get the maximum value here. When delta is zero, you're gonna see that fraction is zero. And if you were to calculate the slope, you will see the slope has very high stiffness. These beta values, for example, can be chosen, uh, like if I chose to have it as one, then uh, you will have different shapes of this curve. The important thing here is that the energy under this curve has to be the critical energy release rate. The critical energy release rate is a major fracture of toughness, and it tells you how propense a material is to fracture. So if, I, if the energy in the system is sufficient to propagate that crack and it achieves a value of GC, then crack will propagate. So if as I go through this curve and I separate these two blocks, it'll become easier to separate them as I go through this curve. And in the process of that, I have expended uh, all that energy to make that happen. And that energy corresponds to the critical energy release rate that by in fact can be actually measured. So right here, this equation is called the constitutive law. And it has a relationship of the traction on that spring as a function of deflection. A linear spring will not have had this softening portion. It will be just infinitely stiff the whole, or not finite, finite stiffness over, over quite a bit of, 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 over a long range of deflections, right? But here we're trying to simulate fractures, so we're allowing it to drop to zero so that there'll be zero stiffness in the spring can now now have simulated the fracture process so how does this work so i have two blocks of material say um the way it works is you embedding that uh interface something called interface elements and in abacus those elements are called a coh 3d8 coh for cohesive 3D because it's three-dimensional and eight because it's eight-noted. So between the, these two solid elements, I'm inserting a layer of <clears throat> interface elements. This layer of interface elements is really comprised of an upper surface and lower surface with eight nodes, one, two, three, four for the bottom surface, five, six, seven, eight for the top surface. And these two surfaces are initially coincident. They're coincident to simulate the fact that these two blocks are bonded together or infinitely uh, stuck together, okay? 
And when separation occurs, then this upper surface and lower surface look separated. The integration of these elements perform at the mid surface of this element. Uh, and you can see again that these two surfaces will be coincident when things are not fractured but then they'll come apart when things become fractured. So, so what keeps these two surfaces together is a bunch of nonlinear springs like this one. But instead of one spring, you have infinite number of springs that connect the top surface with the bottom surface all across the element. And you can see here that I have these two blocks together and then this is shown the separation of the two so it's clear to see. And these elements are in there in between and they can come apart. I don't want to go into a very extensive theory, but at the bottom here, you see the weak form of the problem. The weak form of the problem. You can see the traction times the, the variation of the deflection. So the cross, the jump across these two uh, surfaces, that's delta U. And, and that's that's the traction that's acting on this surface, on this body. Uh, and that's also acting on the bottom body. Then I also have the tractions acting along the springs. That has to be equal to the stress uh, acting through the deflections, the variations of the deflections, the strains, I'm sorry. And so that's your principle of virtual work. We don't have to go into this extensive detail right now, the bottom line is that we're going to use this type of element inserted in between these two blocks of material that are governed by a principle of virtual work. And as an example, the shape functions for an element like that could look like this. Uh, these are the isoparametric shape functions. Um, and this will be, say, for example, for a four noted. For eight noted, it looks a lot more complicated. But I'm showing you for, for a four noted what it will look like look very similar to what you've seen for a quadrilateral element. So now you're ready to go. Uh, you can now take this equation and plug in really quickly the deflection as a function of shape functions times the nodal deflections, the strain as a function of nodal deflections, and the displacement jump, um, because there is a displacement jump across this point to that point. So this displacement across because that, that simulate the fracture. Uh, so that displacement can be written in terms of nodal deflections. Once I do that, I plug, plug that in into the weak form. That allows me to find the equations that need to be solved. What you see here at the bottom is the constitutive behavior for nonlinear springs in a cohesive element, the cohesion element. Uh, and usually this constitutive law has to be developed because this is what explains how the fracture process occurs. In this example I showed was separation in one direction. But mode one separation is this one, but then you can have mode two where it slides. This material slides with respect to the bottom one. That'll be mode two. And mode three happens when it slides in the other, out of the plane direction, out of the page direction, with respect to the bottom block. So with that said, you're able to then uh, come up with some sort of constitutive law. And there's many of them out there. You have to find the right one for the particular application. They will satisfy some sort of interaction strength criteria and some sort of mixed mode failure criteria for fracture. But that's beyond what we want to achieve in this particular lecture, which is to show you how to use the, the cohesion elements. And if you want to learn more, I invite you to then go uh, into this um, thesis to learn more about the formulation of these elements and then be able to apply it for a practical application. So to, to really be able to use any of this stuff, you need G1C, G2C, and G3C. You need to get these fracture toughnesses, and one way to get them is through ASTM standards. So ASTM D5528 helps you measure the, the fracture toughness for mode one G1C using the double cantilever beam. You can also use a mixed mode fracture test called the ASTM D6671 mixed mode bending test. And this test allows you to vary the mode mixity. So you have some mode one and some mode two 
or get a lot of mode two and a lot of or less mode one. You can basically uh, change the mode. But these two tests are very, very widely used. That was that's what informs G1C, G2C, and those values. Very important tests that need to be performed. I think what we want to do now, now that I give you a little intro about cohesive elements, which are basically nonlinear springs that connect the top surface with the bottom surface. And those nonlinear springs follow a constitutive law like this, where it has very high state behavior at the beginning to simulate infinitely bonded surfaces, and then simulates a softening response, which simulates the fracture process with the energy corresponding to the critical energy release rate. I think with that information, we're ready to jump and have Vishesh help us to walk how you will do the simulation of the double cantilever beam using cohesive the cohesion elements. With that said, thank you very much, Vishesh. Over to you. Welcome to another Abacus tutorial in Introduction to Finite Element Method. Today, we're going to be learning how to simulate a double cantilever beam test. What is the double cantilever beam test? The double cantilever beam or DCB test is a very commonly used method that is used to measure the, the initiation values and the propagation values for the mode one fracture energy uh, of a material under static and cyclic loading condition. As you might be able to see in the diagram, what this entails is introducing an initial crack into a cantilever and then applying forces on both ends perpendicular to the direction of the crack to determine what the, what the fracture energy is going to be. A little bit about the mathematics of this test. This is the main equation that determines the fracture energy of the currently uh, being applied load in the test. As you can see, the fracture energy is directly proportional to the square of the force that is being applied, as well as to the length of the crack. Apart from that, it is inversely proportional to the Young's modulus of the material, the moment of inertia, and the width of the cantilever that's being tested. Now, if the fracture energy of the current process is less than the critical fracture energy of the material, the crack will not propagate, it will be stationary. Whereas if it equals the critical fracture energy, the crack will begin to propagate. So what are we going to do today? We're going to use Abacus to simulate a double cantilever beam test with a CFRP epoxy laminate, CFRP being carbon fiber reinforced polymer. This is a brief walkthrough of the geometry that we're going to be simulating. This is a normal cantilever of length 150 millimeters. Uh, the width of the cantilever is 20 millimeters. The height of the cantilever is 1.98 millimeters, which is evenly divided on both sides of the crack that has been introduced. The length of the crack along the length of the cantilever initially also known as A0, is 50 millimeters. This is a brief walkthrough of the material properties of the CFRP laminate that we're going to be simulating. These are the mechanical properties, the Young's modulus, the bulk, mod the bulk modulus, and the Poisson ratio. And these are the in interface properties. The interface properties are important because we're going to be modeling the single cantilever as two individual cantilevers which are bonded at one end and have a crack at the other end. Uh, we're going to be looking at how we, how we do that as we move on to Abacus now. Welcome to Abacus. So we'll start by creating our part as usual. And instead of creating a single single cantilever with a crack, we'll create two identical half cantilevers and bond them 
for the first 100 mm. And let me show you how to do that. So we'll click on create part. A part will be a 3D part of deformable type. It will be a solid of extrusion type. So we click on rectangle. Our first point will, of course, be the origin. Our second point will be the entire length of the cantilever along the x-axis and half the width of the cantilever along the y-axis. Cross this out and click done. Our depth, of course, is 20 mm. That is our half part. Now, before we replicate this part to create the other half, what we're going to do is create a few partitions. Our first partition is going to be up to the length that we want our crack to be at. So for that, I click on Create Datum Plane Offset From Plane. Click the plane I need to offset from. Enter value. If the direction is wrong, I click Flip. I say OK. And offset this by 50 mm since, since that's my initial crack length. Datum Plane has been created here. We create a second datum plane at exactly half the width of the cantilever in order that we obtain this point that we have to apply a force at. So I enter value. The direction seems to be correct. I click OK and I offset by 10 mm. What I do next is click on partition cell, use datum plane. Since there's only one cell initially, I just have to click the datum plane. So that's, I'll cl click the crack division and create partition. Now I'll select this cell to partition, click done, and select this datum plane to partition the cell. Now we can copy our part. I right click, click on copy. I, I rename the part, part two. And there we are. We've created our, our our CAD essentially now. Our next step is to define the material property. So I create a material. I call it CFRP. And I define the mechanical properties of the material. Since I've been given the engineering constant, I click on engineering constant. My E1 is 150 gigapascal. E2 is 11 gigapascal, as is my E3. My new 1, 2 and new 1, 3 are 0.25. My new 2, 3 is 0.45. G1, 2 and G1, 3 are 6 gigapascal. And G2, 3 is 3.7 gigapascal. What we do next is create a section. I'm going to call this CFRP also, a homogeneous solid. I click on continue, and press OK. Now I try to assign these sections to the parts that I've created. So I've gone to part one. I've clicked on assign section. I'm going to select all my cells, click on done, and say OK. And I'm going to follow the same steps for part two also. Now, since we've defined engineering constants in the material, these engineering constants are in particular directions. So we need to tell uh, Abacus what these directions are. And for that, I'll click on assign material orientation. I'll select the cells to assign material orientation to, click on done. Say use default orientation or other method and simply assign the default orientation. And I'll follow the same steps again for part one. Okay, so now that we've defined our material properties, we can move on to creating an instance. And this is where we separate our parts because they are currently coincident. I click on auto offset from other instances, select both my parts, and say OK. Now, before coming back to assembly, before joining these in the orientation that they're supposed to be joined in, I try and model the interaction between these parts. Since I need this plane and the 
lower plane of this cantilever to be bonded and I have been given the, the interaction properties. So I click on create interaction. My interaction type is going to be surface to surface contact obviously. Now I select the master surface. It doesn't matter for uh, too much for uh, symmetric uh, analysis like this, but still, let me say this is my master surface. I click done. My slave surface, my slave type will also be surface, obviously. And to select my slave surface, I rotate my model, cross this out, click on this surface and say done. Now over here we need to do two things. The first is to choose my discretization method as node to surface so that the surface of the master is modeled against the nodes, the individual nodes of the slave and we can model separation more, separation more accurately. And the second is to define a contact interaction property. The type is going to be contact and we'll define two types of properties. The first will be damage, which is essentially the stress at which I can say that my uh, bonding no longer works, that my normal value is 60 megapascal and my shear values are 80 and 80 megapascal each. My criterion will be quadratic fraction. I click OK. Now another property that I need to model and, 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 and if I need to model another property I can do it either from that dialog box or, sim or simply go to interaction properties over here. Click on interprop. I need to obviously model the cohesive behavior because these are bonded. And for that, we're going to specify the stiffness coefficients, which we've been given 0 0.352, 1 1.45, and 1.45. I click OK. So there, I've modeled my interaction now. Now I can go back to assembly and join these two together. For that, I click on translate instance, select the instance to translate, click on done. I choose to translate this node to this point. I click on OK and you'll see that we finally created our cantilever as it should be. Next, I click on step and I define a new step. I create a new step. This will be a static general type step. I will toggle on nonlinear effects since we have large deflections here. Automatic stabilization will be by specified dissipated energy fraction and I'll define a, a lower initial increment. For better stability and for better convergence we can also go to other general solution controls and edit my time step. where I go to the time incrementation tab, click on specify, change my I0 to 20, my IR to 40, and my IA also to 20. Now that I've defined the step, I need to define the load. And since this is a symmetric analysis, we don't really need to define too many constraints. The only two nodes that we'll define, uh, the only two loads that we'll define will be on these points on the two ends of our half cantilevers. And I'll show you how to do that. I click on create load, concentrated force. I select the node on which my force is to be applied and click on done. Since our load is in the y direction, I'll say CF2. And let's say my load is 75. I add another load and 
follow the same steps to define a load. And I'll define the same load but in the opposite direction. And I click on OK again. So as we can see, our loads have been defined. Our last step now is simply to mesh our parts. And we mesh our parts individually. So I go to part one, choose an approximate global size. This seems fine. Now to prevent locking issues, I can also choose an edge length along the width of my half cantilever, as I've done. And since the width is 0.99, maybe I want three elements along the, the width, and I say 0.33 is my element size. I apply and click OK, and I mesh my part. I also need to take care that my, my element type is appropriate. So I'll select this region to assign my element type and assign an element of, of type C3D8i. I click OK. Now I repeat the exact same steps as I did that I did for part one, for part two as well. I assign an edge length, a mesh. and I assign an element type. So that, that's all the modeling we needed to do. All I need to do now is submit my job. I'll call this BCB and continue. Assign it all the processes that I can. Click on Submit. Our analysis should ideally not take too much time since there aren't too many elements of nodes. Uh, and the analysis is also pretty simple. Since we haven't defined a maximum time step, uh, we should also get uh, our results in, in, in not too much time. And we open the monitor here. And we should have our results in not too long. Well, there you go. 11 steps is all it took. And our analysis is complete. We can now go and check out our results. Our results are very much unexpected lines. You can see that uh, some failure has, has happened in the cohesion region also. And uh, the crack has also panned out. What we're going to do next is some post-processing, which is forming the force displacement uh, plot. And that shouldn't be too hard. For that, what we'll do is we'll click on x, y, ODB field output, unique nodal. What, what I want to do here is find out the displacement, the force as a function of the displacement for perhaps the center node. So I click on RF2, U2, and select the node I want these parameters for. Let's say, let's say I want it for this node. And I click Save. Click OK. I've I've received these two XY data 
but this is not where it ends. We will try to create a combined XY data of U and RF, uh, as well as export it to Excel and compare it with data from literature. So for that, I click on create XY data, operate on XY data, click on continue. Uh, I need, I choose the combine operator from here and I combine along the X direction U2 from part two and along the Y direction RF2 from part two. And I say save as, I call this F D plot, click on OK. Oh, I think I haven't. There, and save as, I call this F D plot, click on OK. Cancel this, and now go to plugins, click on tools, and Excel utilities. And I try to export my FD plot into Excel. So there. So I'll now access my results. So as you can see, we've obtained not just the FD data, this is the T data and this is the F data, uh, but also a plot. Now, the reason that this plot might seem weird is that the D data seems to have been imported as labels. So there's no need to worry. What we'll do is we'll create our own plot. So this is the displacement. So the force. Since the displacement here is negative, since the displacement was in the downward direction, we we'll import it as positive. And import the force as is. And we'll create our own plot which looks something like this. So what I'm going to do now is compare this to data that we have already from literature. I'm going to copy and paste that data. There, as you might be able to see, our displacements are a little more, so the graph is extended, but we've managed to nearly replicate the data that is already present in literature, which, which verifies our simulation somewhat. Uh, the force seems to increase linearly until uh, fracture occurs, after which it, it decreases as per this trend. So there, that those were our results, and this was our simulation in Abacus. I hope you learned something nice. Thank you very much.